Hello, my name is Lowell, and uh, this is a seminar that I had an idea for. And then I roped two amazing GMs in to, to help me with this. Uh, so I wanted to talk about GM moves, reactions, cuts, as some games call them, uh, the kind of choices and consequences, and even sort of tangential but related, the, the devil's bargains from Force in the Dark, all these things that GMs can do to kind of set the stage. And uh, because I think they're so important and I know it took me a long time to get used to them. It took me a long time to figure out how they worked, how to, how to use them best uh, and to, to get more flexible and more interesting with, with what I do with them. And I think I miss them now when I'm playing other games that, that don't have those things. And I try to think about how I can do that in a similar way in those games. So I, I don't think they necessarily need introduction, but I will. Uh, we have Jamie uh, Jamila, who is a, a, a wondrous GM and designer and gauntleteer. Uh, and uh, we have Shane, uh, who has come on like gangbusters and run the most amazing, wondrous games on the gauntlet. These are both people that I've heard nothing but great things about what they do at the table. Uh, and like, so Sherry plays in a lot of Jamie's games, Sherry being my wife. And so I will be treated to, after many of Jamie's games, uh, Sherry come in going, you won't believe what Jamie did to us. And then she tells me, and I go, I don't believe what Jamie did to you. So, so that it's, it's great. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank you all for, for uh, joining us. And we're going to kind of work through uh, our, our questions and we're gonna take turns with that. Uh, so I'm gonna hand the floor over to, to Jamie. Hi, everybody. So once again, thank you so much uh, for being here. It's so great to have you. Yeah, so I'm going to lead us into our first question. Um, actually, I'm, I'm just thinking about Sherry. There was a time I had someone, uh, Josh joined one of our Brinkwood games on the Gauntlet, and Josh and I had played off the Gauntlet before. And I apologize for a particularly hard move I did while we were playing Brinkwood. And Josh said, oh, no, I'm used to, I'm used to your hard moves and how hard they can go. I said, oh yeah, I've been kind of going easy on, on the people on the gauntlet. And Sherry was like, you've been going easy on us? This is you on easy? <laughs> what? what? Uh, but Brinkwood is a game of vampires and rebellion, so it's a lot more intense. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go into my first question for everybody, right, for Shane and Lowell. What's a really cool GM move from a game you ran or played in recently, right, like that? It really sticks out to you. I know Shane talked about how she was going to go be a hard <laughs> so that she has something to talk about. Do you want to go hers? Uh, sure. I, yeah, I don't know that I really delivered like the epic GM move that I was hoping for in the session I ran just before this that I would be able to talk to you about now. Um, I, I do just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that I'm speaking on today. So the uh, Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation and just acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, but to answer your question, Jamie, I am going to take you back to a game that we played together. Uh, Blake, you were there as well. Uh, this was our game of the between, and this really stands out to me as one of the most memorable uh, GM moves uh, in a game that I've run or played recently. It was Gabe's character, the American, had gone off by himself uh, to investigate the cannibal pie-making family. Uh, and he decided that he would climb, he would just go down the stairs in their empty and abandoned pie shop into the basement, uh, which I think is such a good, like, horror movie moment. Like, if you're watching this movie, you would be screaming at him, like, don't go down there by yourself. What are you doing? Uh, and so there was an establishing question as he went down, which was like, what do you, you see... Uh, something that shows you how the Fig family have been killing their victims. And Gabe established that it was a guillotine. So there's this huge, like, full-scale French Revolution guillotine in the basement of this pie shop. And he pokes around, he does some investigating, all of that. And then he hears somebody coming down the stairs. So he goes to leave. 
And of course, it's one of the cannibals uh, with his big knife on the stairs. So he has to roll some dice to, to get by. And he rolled a miss. So, you know, like Apocalypse World, I think a lot of the early PBTA games really emphasise like one of the times you make a hard move is when a player hands you a golden opportunity. I feel like this is the definition of that situation. So I thought about some options and the move that we eventually dealt with as we came back to him was, so uh, Gabe, you regain consciousness and just let that hang for a moment because I knew I could like wring some player angst out of it. Said, you find that Obert Fig has strapped you into the guillotine and he's running his knife against the rope that's holding the blade above your neck. And I really got the good, like, groaning but excited reaction that I want out of a player when I make a move. So uh, that was uh, very memorable and that really stands out to me. Excellent, excellent. That sounds really, really good. Uh, yeah, in that game of the between, uh, Shane was just like, like throwing up the the hard bows like candy very delicious horrible candy so uh Lowell how about you well I'll actually tell one that I did this afternoon uh we were playing Hearts of Ulin and this is a scenario I have where there's a bride and a groom and we had two PCs and uh we had a PC uh that was in love with the bride uh, and we had a PC that was in love with the groom and they were actually siblings, the two PCs. And they go and the, the, the brother goes to introduce his sister uh, to them. They haven't met, but this is the first time she's talking to the object of her affection to the, to the bride. And I say, make an inner conflict role. And they fail. And... And often with, with inner conflict, it's about running away. It's about marking the, the, their uh, elements, but they roll this miss and she starts, you know, she's upset. She starts kind of playing out that, that she's bothered. And suddenly these hands reach out and take her hands and, and comfort her. And it is the groom who is in love with her brother, who has suddenly become smitten with her on this first meeting and is suddenly in love with her. And he's like, oh, oh no, it's all right. It's just, I can't believe your brother didn't introduce you before. And, and I can't believe you did that. And, and the look on Lloyd's face with the brother was just like, it's just absolute shock and horror as he realized where exactly this was going. And of course the bride is in love with somebody else and she's reacting, it was, it was so tasty. It was so delicious. So much fun. Perfect, perfect. I love that so much. Yeah, I'm going to um, uh, buck the trend a little bit because uh, it's it's still a it's still a GM move. I'm going to bring up one of the Devil's Bargains uh, I gave recently. So Devil's Bargains are one of my personal favorite mechanics, and what I really try to do is. I try as much as possible to offer a devil's bargain that's really intense, but also hard to resist. I feel like when I hit that, you know, where people are like, ooh, you're gonna hurt me, but I want you to hurt me this way. It's kind of what I try to, to aim for. So what happened with, with that recently was, uh, so in, in our game of Decline of Bleach uh, that, that we're play testing, Sherry, so this is one of the times I heard Sherry. So uh, Sherry's character uh, has the curse of loss, right? And so I asked, well, you know, if you want that extra die, I could, I could offer you a bargain, you know, uh, a, a curse bargain based on your curse of loss. And Sherry's like, oh, but loss is terrible. I chose that for myself, but it's a, it's a terrible, but I'll hear it, I'll hear it, which I, which I, I just need to, I know I'm on the right track if they go, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to it, I'll listen to it. And so, uh, I offered, well, you can gain more power to convince the nobles to allow you to build this, this minor house on your terms, right? And you can get the help of your fiance to do so. But uh, doing so will mean that you know that by her gaining more power, she will lose an important part of herself that she can never regain again. A part of your curse will infuse within her. And she was like, oh no. But what's that part? What, what is she going to lose? And I was like, well, 
you know, this is your curse. You could ensure it's a bad part that gets lost, right? Like, we don't all have good parts, right? The curse could take that. You just have to let the curse go and then... Like, I, I really have to explain that sometimes this is like being a devil on someone's shoulder. <laughs> is what you're trying to go for. Um, and then Sherry was like, yeah, okay. Like, you kind of want them to hit a moment where there's a bit of hubris, right? Where they're like, yes, I can, I'll take this now and I'll convince myself I can make this work for myself. So that's that's one of the devil's bargains that I like to do. And Sherry said, yeah, so she got that extra die and I got to have that extra juiciness. Uh, for that NPC, so it's a lot of fun. <laughs> cool. So uh, I wanted to ask, um, what's something that you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started GMing? I guess first started GMing, you know, PBTA games or other games that use these kinds of moves. Should we just go with like the, the order that we've established for people? So Lol, I might throw to you first. Sure. Uh, one of the things that Early on, I mean, uh, uh, it took me a while. I ran PBTA before I understood PBTA. And Rich Rogers was very generous uh, in not saying, you don't know how this works. Uh, uh, but it took me a while to kind of figure things out. One of the things is, of course, uh, I thought of GM moves as very much one-to-one. -one. This thing happens and we do a reaction to it, you know, and the fallout is is linked to that that action that has been done and eventually began to realize that pbat works better for me when we kind of open that up when we don't lock it down to that so if a miss is rolled in another in a situation uh in like in a hotel in a room whatever that hard move that comes might not come right away or it might cut to a scene that's off screen where we see someone betraying someone else. Like it, it doesn't have to link up. Something dramatic is going to happen. Something's going to move forward, but it, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one lock. And uh, it's, it's better if we're looking at those as kind of, of choices uh, and, and opportunities there. So I, I, it, I was very rigid about that. Okay, uh, announce future badness, mark harm, all of those kinds of things were very easy and I would stick to that. And I don't feel like I got PBT until I started to take all of those GM moves, admonitions in a much more abstract way. Yeah, yeah, I noticed Shane's really good at that. Like uh, when I'm in Shane's games, like, oh, it's a hard move and Shane's like, Yes, I'll pocket that for now. Like, oh, it's more terrifying. <laughs> the rest of us are like, oh no. <laughs> Shane is super good. I have to, I have to work on, on pocketing uh, things. But yeah. Anyway, Shane, you were gonna say. Oh, oh no, go ahead. Do you do you want to answer? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, in terms of what I wish I knew now versus when I first started GMing, so I used to. What works for me now is I actually don't look too hard at the at the GM or keeper moves. And I think it's because what I started doing is I like watching a lot of a lot of TV shows. I like watching a lot of films. And I think it's because games like Powered by the Apocalypse and Forge in the Dark really favor a very cinematic approach, like a very strong sense of momentum in the narrative. And so it got to the point where I would I think it was very clear when I was preparing for Mask, because Mask was my first PBTA game. So I watched a lot of like Young Justice, Teen Titans, and everything within that genre. And I started to break down what the players were doing. Oh, so this is them like um, unleashing their powers, and this is them taking a powerful blow. And I also started to break apart this is the move that the GM does, right? This is the GM separating them. This is the GM doing this. This is the GM pushing the labels, right? And so Nowadays, like I tend to really watch things and my brain is always thinking like, what kind of GM move is happening in this moment? Like, did, are they saving this right now? And so I always bring this up in my, in my facilitator camp, but my favorite example is Riverdale. I know Riverdale is like one of the trashiest shows and this, this latest season is not good. My, my partner, Matthew loves Riverdale. He doesn't like this latest season, but Season three, Griffins and Gargoyles. Uh, yes, it's a uh, 
um, they create a D&D thing uh, just for the show. It's really great. Uh, but basically Riverdale is my favorite example of like GM moves because the GM tends to go really hard and really intense, uh, but it always makes sense in the narrative. So uh, that's what I wish I knew then, which I knew now, which is like to really lean upon the original influences and strengths of the cinematic systems and uh, until it becomes like natural where I don't have to think about it too hard, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanna to add to that uh, what you said. What has always struck me is when I when I think about GM moves, it's like I'm watching sometimes the show of the game, and I'm thinking, oh, what would be cool if that happened now? Like, like that that's that's certain of my muse is what would I like to see if I were watching this show? One hundred percent. So I have two uh, an answer to this question in two parts. So two things that I had to sort of learn slowly over time that I wish I'd known when I first started uh, running PBTA games. So the first is um, when I first started running these games, I had this, I, you know, this idea about what fiction first gaming kind of meant. And so I had quite a strong focus on the GM moves that were less mechanical and more fictionally focused, if that makes sense. Um, I thought that was going to make the games more interesting. So you know, I didn't want to inflict harm. I wanted to announce off-screen badness or I didn't want to take a string on someone. I wanted to tell them the possible consequences and ask. So all those kinds of things, I, I wanted to avoid the mechanics of the game. I think now I would see that as a mistake in two ways. So the first way that's a mistake is that if the game's designed well, that's a false distinction, right? Like if the game works well, then there, there's no difference between making a mechanical move and making a fictional move. They're, they're inherently intertwined. The second is now, and I differ strongly from Jamie, I look very closely at the list of GM moves in a game. Uh, I like to have it printed out or even handwritten beside me when I'm running a game so I can refer to it. Um, and what I, one of the main things that I look for in a new game when I look at the moves list is some sort of strong default mechanical move that is always going to be available. Um, so like examples of that would be conditions in the Between or Brindlewood Bay. Like you can just always slap on a condition uh, as, a, as a response. It always works well. Or marking an element in Hearts of Willin as well. Like that's a really great example. You can always do that on a miss. Like it's always going to work. It's always going to drive the fiction. The reason this is useful for me is because I'm much more stressed out if I'm like, oh, I've got to think of something creative. I've got to think of something cool and fictional to do now. Whereas if I think, okay, I have this thing that I can do. I can give them a condition. If I think of something better than that, then I'll do the better thing. But e either of them is going to be okay. Like it takes pressure off myself uh, and I feel less anxious and more calm and, and therefore uh, more creative. So reframing it in that way has been really helpful for me. The other thing uh, that I do differently now than when I started is that I just want to go like pretty hard from the start of the game. Uh, I think like we're going to talk more about hard and soft moves, but that's not exactly what I mean. I think earlier I had more of a sense of like wanting to hold something back, wanting to have something for later. And I think that that was a mistake. Like, you know, I was reading Monster Hearts this morning before I ran it uh, for GCOG and there's a lot of talk about like setting up and knocking down the, the, the situation, the moves, the reactions, but I, I just want to knock it down. Like I think the setup generally do, like doesn't get you enough. Like often I would find myself, you know, foreshadowing something or setting something up and it was something that would be interesting if it happened, but then the players would, of course, uh, intervene. And so we, we would never actually get the good part to the table. So uh, now I really like to, I mean, especially on the gauntlet where so many of the players just love their characters to be absolutely brutalized. I just want to go straight for the most dramatic, like the meatiest uh, part of the move that I can make. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean like the most brutal. That's that's definitely not what I mean either. Um, a really memorable hard move that Jim Crocker made when he was running uh, Hearts of Will in game that I played in earlier this year was that I blew a roll in the first, I rolled a miss in the very first scene in the first like five minutes of the game. And the hard move in response was that the terrifying villain slept with me. Uh, and it really, like, it was, it was just such an amazing, like, dramatic reaction. Um, 
And again, like it just went right to the like media's most dramatic part. There was no like holding it back. We're five minutes into the game and I'm already in the deepest imaginable trouble. Um, so that was really great. So those to me are, are, are the two things, the, the two sort of ways that my approach is different now uh, than it used to be. Awesome, awesome. And you alluded to this next question, Shane, which I think is an important one. And actually, this distinction is part of what got me thinking about doing a panel like this, because Dan Brown had talked about, about the shades between what's a hard move and what's a soft move. So, uh, Jamie, we'll start with you. How, how do you define a soft move and a hard move? And like, how are we playing that out at the table then? Yeah, so a soft move is when I tend to give people the space to react to something where, so this sort of like bleeds into how I don't believe in perception moves or, or keeping information away from the players too much, right? So, but basically a soft move is usually when I will key in what a character would know in the situation and, and let them know how, how dangerous the situation is. So for example, if I'm running uh, Blades in the Dark, I'll tell the Whisper who's a supernatural uh, character who can connect to the ghost field and stuff like that. I'll say things like, you can sense the temperature dropping and you can hear the ghost field starting to buckle in the distance. You can feel someone pressing, uh, you know, pressing against it. Like I'll, I'll give them information that only they would know. I feel like that's a great soft move because they know that they're in trouble. They know that the group is in trouble, but no one else knows it yet, right? So that character knows and no one else does. But I give them, I give them the room to respond. And a hard move, I'm gonna admit, like Shane, I like to go for the hard moves as, as much as possible. Um, I do think, because things can always get worse, right? So might as well just start uh, from a dramatic, interesting place. But a hard move is definitely where you're, you're forcing the player into a situation where they have to respond. They have no other choice but to respond or things will continue to get far worse, right? And one of the things that I personally had to, like when I was designing games, I realized I had to put this in examples in the PBTA or PBTA inspired games I had where for me, when I use a hard move, I, I, I'm willing to dramatically change the fiction, right? So if I had an NPC and in my mind, I was like, this NPC is gonna help everybody. This NPC is like very forthcoming. So, but when it comes to, uh, we had like a reveal your heart move in Apocalypse Keys, which is kind of like the comfort and support move uh, in a lot of other PBTA games. And uh, my player rolled a miss, right? And so I was thinking, oh yeah, this NPC totally wants to go on this date, right? It's totally open to like all the making out of this party, right? And so, but with the hard move, I thought, well, I guess now they're part of a secret cult and they're trying to initiate this person into the cult. <laughs> That's just the natural progression. Um, so, I mean, they still wanted to like make out, I guess, but really they just wanted to take the PC soul and, you know, fire up a ritual and, you know, and I wouldn't have thought of that if the player hadn't rolled a miss and if I didn't have the opportunity to use a hard move. So I'm always willing to like dramatically shift the narrative towards, you know, even if it means changing what I originally thought was going on with an NPC or what I originally thought was going on in the fiction, I feel like, it's great too. And I've seen that with Loa before where like, I think there was a similar move. My character was like trying to connect to another one and I wrote a miss and I could see Loa's face like look so sad because I knew Loa was like, I wanted this moment for the two of you. <laughs> like I wanted it to be. It was an Academy of the Blade. I wanted to, but I'm going to have to have this person be cruel and have a secret plan the whole time that will undermine. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's the difference for me when it comes to those things. All right, so, uh, sorry, Lola, shall I jump in here? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't really think about harder and softer moves when I'm playing per se. Like I, I don't really, you know, that distinction's not so useful uh, in the way I think about it. But what I think about like a lot when I'm running games that I think is relevant is, is pacing. Uh, and specifically, you know, almost all the games I run are three or four hours with a break 
uh, at the top of each hour. And I want there to be some sort of dramatic cliffhanger leading into each of the breaks. So what that means is that the first, like the first part of this of each hour session, each you know first 30, 40 minutes, uh, we're just going to play along. If a dramatic move comes up, it comes up, but mostly I'm probably making relatively softer moves. But in the last 10 to 15 minutes, I've, I've just got my eye on pushing, like finding a way to something very dramatic to happen right before the break. Um, so, I mean, an example from the game I ran today is that we were going into the first break in Monster Hearts. And let's see, it was all about this like theatre production and the character, sorry, it's so complicated, the character playing the actor who was playing the Wicked Witch of the West um, wanted the actor playing the Cowardly Lion to help her uh, arrange an accident for the actor playing Dorothy so that uh, the Wicked Witch could take her part. And so, like, I saw this starting to line up and we were getting close to the end. So I was like, okay, so at the end of this session, what I want is for the for Esme to tell Will that she wants to arrange an accident for Judy and Judy to be there and hear that, like, that's our, our like, move into the break. Like, just like, you know, Jamie talked about cinema and TV and stuff before, like in the same way that you would want to set up the end of an episode in a in an ongoing series. So, yeah, so I always want us to get to the end of that section as much as possible and either have like just delivered a hard move that they can be like, oh no, about all through the break. Um, or if the situation is bad enough already and they roll a miss, then the miss, can, like the reaction can just wait till after the break and that, that can be what they worry about. Uh, during the break uh, because again like the the response I want to any of my moves well to a lot of my moves is just agonized delight from the players like this this look of uh, I mean what I really want is for them to look like that was inevitable like that was the right thing to happen that it the you know that it's awful but that it's also fun um, the other useful thing about that approach um, and think about in terms of pacing and I think Jamie sort of alluded this to this before as well. Whenever someone rolls a miss, or really whenever anyone rolls dice, uh, I'm not going to deliver a move straight away. I'm going to go to somebody else first. I'm going to see what the other characters are doing or the other part of the group. Uh, that's largely about pacing, but it's also largely about me needing some time to figure out what's going to happen. So both really useful uh, just to cut away like that. So I didn't really answer your question at all, but I, I that's probably as close as I get to thinking about uh, no, but approach. I think that's valid, right? Like if the if the distinction doesn't work for you, then yeah. that's also very valid. I think there is too much pressure to go at it from a binary perspective, right? Like soft versus hard, but I think it's really more of a like a spectrum, like what really feels right in the moment. So yeah, yeah, I think those are good points. And you know what what Dan had said that, that struck me about that soft hard moves and one one genre's soft move is another genre's hard moves and that 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 there is a level to that uh and i think that that applies a little bit to what you're saying about the the structure of the session i think that's really really smart i don't think when we get gm advice i don't think people are talking about what's the structure of a, of a session like what's the structure of a table play as much as we should because i do think there is is that need to figure out kind of what the blocks are, where we're going to hit those beats, uh, or not even necessarily hit those beats, but that's what we're going to be looking for those opportunities to to really really uh, strike on those things, and and flow is so important. Like often, I'll go to the quick mechanical like market element, or do this or that because I want to move on to the next moment. Like that has. We've, we're in the middle of, of some momentum and stopping to do a complete swerve move is going to take away the momentum from everyone in the scene. Um, especially where, like, I love masks, but masks has a lot of like hard moves roll into rolling other moves into, you know, other things. And I'm not as fond of that. Like, like I, I want a move to do its thing and then we go forward. Um, you know, or we, or we take a breath before we come to the, to the next thing. But if I had to make a distinction 
between the hard and soft moves. For me, a hard move, A, exactly like Shane said, they come late. They, they come where we can hit those high pitch points at, at, at uh, cliffhangers. Uh, those, those are the, the, the points at which I'm, I'm gonna be really looking at the hard moves. And hard moves, like they change the scene, they change the momentum, they change the direction. Like when we get a hard move on there, that's, that's a turn, that's a shift. Whereas for me, in my mind, a soft move is a move that forces some choices on the player. Forces now, okay, what direction are we gonna be taking this? Like, how are you gonna handle this? What, I've put a problem in your lap. It's not, it's not that this person has killed your NPC, it's that they might kill your NPC and how are you gonna help with that? What are you gonna do now? That's the difference for me between that hard and and soft move. Uh, and I, I think that's really, in my mind, like, how is that going to change the momentum of, of the moment? How much power does the player have now? Like, is the miss a complete loss of autonomy or is a miss just kind of messing up my plans a little? That's yeah. my thought. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I also wanted to add to that because... Um, once again, I, I, I feel like running both PPTA games and uh, FITD games has really like helped me in general as a GM in both games. But what's interesting about when I run Blades of the Dark or other Forge of the Dark games is uh, I've been playing with Sean Nittner recently and he keeps reminding me, you can go harder because we can resist, right? And this is not something that's available to you in, uh, in PPTA games for the most part, right? So. Uh, there was a time, and this was on stream, where I said, yeah, like, you know, she she grabs the neck of your beloved and you can hear the bone starting to, you know, to crack as she's like a supernatural being. Uh, and, and Sean was like, you know, she can just break his neck because we can resist that. And I was like, well, Sean, if you want me to go ahead and do that. I can do that. Anyway, that, that session ended on that note with the sound of the neck breaking and a ghost saying, I can help you, right? So, um, but yeah, but basically what's what I really like about Forge in the Dark that's really interesting is you can really push people uh, into really desperate situations because the game really sings when the players are using all the resources at their disposal, using their abilities to like shift and resist consequences and, and change things around. If you go too soft in a game like Blades of the Dark, they're not taking advantage of the full system, right? Your players are not able to engage with every part of it. So that's also something to, uh, to consider that I keep in mind. But yeah, so I think with that, we can, we can go into our next question, which is, uh, I'd like to ask everybody, what's your general approach with costs and consequences, right? When you think about these two things in your game? Because because usually, like we've been talking about this up to this point with hard moves and soft moves and GM moves, but cost and consequence tends to come up a lot. So what's your general approach with those two? So uh, like I understand we're talking about like seven to nine results basically, right? Like that's where we're going with this. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least that, that was how, that's what I'm going to talk about, I guess, it's open to everyone. Um, so one thing that I just did not understand when I started running PBTA games, and this probably really is what I would have wanted like to know when I started, but I held it off for this question. Um, I did not understand that I could use the list of GM moves in the game as costs and consequences. I, I had this bizarre idea in my head that I could only do the GM moves if someone rolled a miss. So they would roll a seven to nine and I would just be at a loss as to how to introduce a complication. But actually that list of GM moves is a, a resource for costs and complications as well. You know, I said I was running Monster Hearts this morning. A perfect cost or complication is, you know, what are you getting monster hearts? Your move is turned back against you. You're, you know, the wrong person hears, a secret is exposed to the wrong person. It's just a matter of giving them that and the success. So, you know, the miss might be that the that your arch enemy has heard you plotting against them. But the, the success is that someone agrees to help you plot and your arch enemy uh, realizes that you're plotting against them. Like, it's just a matter of giving them what they're trying to do with the move because they've rolled a success. A seven to nine is a, a hit in most of the games I run. So they have to get what they wanted. Uh, and then there has to be 
like one of those GM moves on top of it. So that's generally how I think about it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. How about you though? And I think Shane hits at a point that sometimes we we forget, I mean, we've got a lot of good GMs around here uh, and they know this instinctively, but I think it's always worth saying any costs, any consequences, any anything, like even, even on those misses, they shouldn't destroy a player's success. They shouldn't undercut or undermine a player's success. Give them their success. What's happening isn't destroying that or undercutting you. That's that's a, that's sometimes hard for people to to work out. But I think it's it's really important. For me, costs and consequences. Uh, the the best thing to do is to tie them in to the player's self identity, to the player's sense of who they are, and most importantly, the best weapon the GM has against players is their ego. It is, it is play into the things there that, that give them costs that kind of, uh, you know, tweak, tweak who they are. Because some, with those costs, a lot of the times it's, well, you can do this, but this is what the cost is going to be. Are you still going to keep doing this? And, and the, if you make that choice hard, you want to give them choices. Sometimes I'll ask them, like, which are you more, more invested in? Like, do you want this thing to happen or are you more invested in this? And then we kind of look at the costs and consequences from that. I will, I will tell you my absolute favorite moment on the gauntlet of playing into that cost and consequences. And it was a Forge in the Dark game. And we're playing Neo Shinobi Vendetta. And they're, they, these sweet cyber ninja PCs are running on a job. And Fraser has driven his sweet motorcycle into this enemy layer. And he goes to like go down the hallway and, and get to where he's going. And he rolls a four. And four has a cost, has a thing, a consequence. And I say, well, you do it, Frazier, but you don't look as cool as you could. You don't quite turn the bike out. You just kind of make that turn. You don't look great. You just look okay. And then I said, do you want to resist that consequence? And Fraser was like, 100% and spent his stress just so he could look sweet. And, and that's the kind of thing that you want to give them those opportunities to, to, to make those kinds of choices. So cruel, so cruel. <laughs> but yeah, uh, for me, when it comes to cost and consequence, uh, I like to actually one of the things I like to do the most, and this is really like a personal thing as, as a GM, I like to tie it to an NPC. I like to tie it to another person. I think because narratively or fictionally things can happen and we lose track of the story because the story in a TTRPG in a game can get so wild. But if it's tied to an NPC, the NPC will most likely remain there, right? And the NPC will, will often be that history of what has happened in the game so far. And that NPC will always be around for the players to remember oh, this is how they were affected by the costs and consequences of my actions, right? Like it has affected them in, in this way. So, and so usually when, and, and in order for that to really happen, for that to, to, to mean something, then the NPCs have to really be two things for me, uh, which is they have to one mirror something about the PCs. So when I have a, when I have a PC get close when I have an NPC get close to another PC, I think like, what do I want to mirror back to that PC, to that player? Like either as something that they also have or something that's an opposite, right? Something that will bring something out. And the other thing that the NPC should have is that they earnestly want to connect to the PC. Like there is something in the NPC that wants to connect to, to the PC, be it like positively, negatively, usually, somewhere in between, right? And so when the NPCs get up in those costs, get caught up in those costs and consequences, then it really means something. So uh, <laughs> like I, I've had NPCs turn to PCs who were like thinking of doing like something really terrible just for the, like, I have to do this, like even if it means, and I'll have the NPC turn to them and say, I know that you'll do the right thing. 
like no matter what it is i trust you and then you can see like the player's face go like oh no <laughs> I like to do that, especially in Monster Hearts in games like that, where like the, the players don't have access to moves where they can be always nice, you know, so um, just to make it that much, that much sweeter. But yeah, so like what's what's really cool and, and Lowell will know this. I'm an NPC pinata, like NPCs just like shoot out of me. Uh, you just move me slightly and a new NPC will come out. Um, so my, my NPC list is very long in my character keeper, but each of them carries a history. For, for each of the players, which I'm really proud of. And all those costs and consequences are, are tied up uh, in who they are. So uh, yeah, that's that's generally my approach. That's awesome. So I wanted to ask how are Devil's Bargains different from what we've discussed so far? Uh, and I guess I will jump in first with my answer, which will be the shortest answer, which is I have never run a Forged in the Dark game. So uh, I'm just gonna turn it over to the experts here. I, I will say this. I find Devil's Bargains the hardest thing in Forge in the Dark. I find them the toughest thing for a couple of reasons. One is that a Devil's Bargain needs to be attractive. It needs to be attractive in the moment. Uh, and 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 but also have a little bit of weight to it. You want to give it so. That the choice is not not okay. Yeah, I'll take that because then I'll be fine. I'll be happy if that happens. That's that's one thing. The other thing is a devil's bargain happens like it does, and it happens before we even get to the roll. So we've already got this consequence that's in place even before they go to the roll, which can also which can feel really shitty, especially if they've made this devil's bargain and then they flub the roll. And then we get this horrible double down of consequences. So, so I find that tough. Uh, and I find Devil's Bargains difficult because I think they do have the risk of breaking the flow of play. They require you after a roll, people to go, okay, wait, wait, is there Devil's Bargains? We've got to stop. And then we've got to kind of position that. Uh, and, and so that's that's really challenging. Uh, I, I, I want to like use that same thing where I think about what the player like in the back of their mind is going, I hope this doesn't happen, you know, but not like I would hate for this to happen, but kind of, I hope this doesn't happen, but maybe it'll be a problem. I, I, I it's really tough. Like it's really, really uh, difficult. Uh, and, and like, how do I put this? One of the things that's interesting is that the devil's bargains that are in Forge in the Dark are similar but different to those, as Danielle in the chat just mentioned, are different from those in Trophy. Whereas Trophy, actually, you get lots of people uh, uh, giving uh, input on devil's bargains. So it feels like a very, very different thing. Uh, so I'm going to admit, like, I like Forge in the Dark. Uh, I, I enjoy running Forge in the Dark, but Devil's Markets are, are the, the place that, that can trip me up that, that because of that float. So I, I, I don't have a really good sense. But here's the thing. Sherry comes back and tells me that Jamie has the best Devil's Bargain. So, so we, we've now put all the pressure, all the weight on you, Jamie. I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, but yeah, I mean... I do think it takes a while to, to really master. I think my problem, this is kind of a spicy take I will not write on Twitter. Uh, I think one of the problems of the Devil's Bargains in the original Blades of the Dark book is, is that the text that suggests what the Devil's Bargains are and the examples in the book of what the Devil's Bargains are are two different things. So if you just read the text, like the SRD, the Devil's Bargain sound once again, I will not say this on Twitter. They sound really boring. <laughs> like they sound really mean. Uh, they they don't they they don't interest me. But the one in the book example is really good. Like there's an example where the GM says, "Okay, I'll offer you as a devil's bargain that the ghost that you're about to come across is actually your aunt, right?" And so I think those are some. If you're like stuck with the devil's bargain, it's one of those things where. I'm just going to tweak something in the fiction so that now it's more connected to you and it means more to you, but it's not going to pull us too far and it's not going to, like, I'm just introducing this 
this personal complication, right, rather than an outright consequence. And I think it's excellent. But that example in the book does not exist in the list of devil's bargains that are available in the book as well. So I also think like what is mentioned in the chat, that the trophy is a really great way to get people used to what devil's bargains are like, because when you have numerous people thinking of what they could be, though I will say to be careful because I notice like everyone being asked to come up with a devil's bargain all the time can be creatively exhausting for the players, right? So I usually just let them come up with it if they, if they have it, but it also trains me to start thinking more of like, oh, this is what people are like, are afraid of happening, right? And so it, it makes it easier for me to come up with a bargain. I think a really good bargain, and I say this as someone who has like a 95% success rate, right, of people taking <laughs> the bargains is that it's something that is like, will complicate the life of the player down the line, right? Where they're like, ooh, right? Like I'll, I'll say something like, uh, the devil's bargain that I have to offer you is that if you, is that no matter what happens, your childhood friend, it turns out they're caught up in the, in the cult of the machine god, right? And they're like, ooh, that's too delicious to pass up, right? Like, like when you, it's sort of like, yeah, like, like giving them power to like complicate their own characters' uh, lives in really delicious ways. And yeah, I, I try to make it, I, I try not to just be, if it's, a t if it's a clock that's being ticked, I try to make sure it's like, a really interesting clock. Like one of my favorite Devil's Bargains was in one of my first games of, uh, so the, the current Blades of the Dark campaign I have, uh, as, a, as a result of a consequence, a ghost just outright possessed one of the players, right? And so they were all ready to fight against the ghost and get rid of the ghost. The ghost stuck around for several sessions. The ghost has only gotten rid of like in the last session. And the main reason is because uh, this was, this goes back to me creating an NPC that's a mirror to the PC, right? So the PC has been through a lot. She has been betrayed by her former crew. She has really gone through the ringer. And the ghost is like, I will help you get your revenge. I will make sure that everybody who has wronged you will pay for it. I understand what it means to be betrayed, right? And so there's that. The ghost is like bringing out the worst in the PC, right? And so there was a tick. There, I mean, there was a clock where... Uh, this is, so it was very clear that even though the ghost is here to quotation mark help, I was very clear because the clock is called, the ghost will take over your body, right? So like, it's like an eight tick clock. And so oftentimes I'll be like, well, if you want a devil's bargain, you know, Athea, the ghost can help you. She's very powerful. She's been through a lot. She's, she's gained a lot of power over the years. You know, just tick that clock and, you know, she'll give you an extra die or, you know, this won't, this won't be a desperate position anymore to be risky now instead. And so we'll say things like, there's still six ticks, there's still four ticks left, like over and over again, just, um, yeah, it's kind of got this nourish element to it, right? Where like you, once again, you're like teasing that you, you're still in control. So you were down to like one last tick, right? And, and going back to what happened earlier, that was when the bad guy had her supernatural strong hands around her boyfriend's neck, right? And the ghost was like, I can help you, I can save him. But there was like one last tick on the clock, right? So uh, super, super, super exciting. But yeah, so I, I do think Devil's Bargains do take some practice, but only in the same way that PBTA and soft moves and hard moves took me some practice, right? So uh, yeah, I think, I think it just best connects to knowing your players well like so this is something that comes easier when I know like for example I'm pretty sure I know how to come up with a devil's bargain that Josh will never say no to I'm 80% sure with Sherry <laughs> right so it, it, it's a it's a thing that that rewards familiarity with your players for sure right so yeah yeah so I, I babbled on a lot about devil's bargains but I just love them so much they're so delicious that, that helps. That actually helps me since I'm running Virgins right now. That helps me give get some perspective on that or, or a place where I struggle. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also I want to say I was so shocked. Uh, I was running Blades in the Dark and I'm so used to downtime actions, not engaging with the rest of the mechanics, right? That was my mindset. And Sean was like, can I take a devil's bargain to get an extra die in this role? And I was like, you can get devil's bargains and downtime actions. I had, 
I'm ready with my library, but I had no idea. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so I'm just going to say that's also something. And it's a nice way to practice because coming up with devil's bargains during downtime actions is easier compared to coming up with them during a score, right? Like when, or whatever the equivalent is in the Forge and the Dark game. So but yeah, anyway, sorry, that's my last bit. Yes. No, yes, no, yes. that's great. <laughs> uh, so those are the questions that we've kind of brought to the table and we've been answering. So what I'd like to do is, is open it up. If anyone has a, a question that they want to address to us, uh, uh, Blake, let's let's start with this, your, your hands up. And if people want to put things in the chat uh, as well uh, 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 with a, like a cue in front of it, so I know. Uh, Blake, let's, let's start with you. Okay. Um, so how do you balance using software hard moves when you've got things like Apocalypse World, which is view NPC through a target reticle, to other games where ongoing NPCs are an important part of the story and the character's evolution and that. So how do you learn out of, you know, do I just blow away this NPC or do I just make their life hard and by extension the character? How do you find that sort of balance? Uh, I, I think it really is that you do have to, to, to look at what, what the genre expects. Uh, in masks, the death of an NPC is a big thing. It, it's a big thing. The, the kinds of peril that happen in superhero stories are injuries, illness, uh, uh, put in the hospital, uh, they're, they're, things are revealed to them that they shouldn't know. And uh, I think that, that, that that's really good. One of the things, though, is there are some games that that really bridge that. Like, there's some Monster Hearts games that you could run more like Riverdale, or or you could run it where where you're you're you've got the real peril in that. And I think that that's a place that you want to calibrate with the players about what they want out of it, uh, in, in terms of what what is going to be put at risk. Um, uh, and then say to them, but when we get to the last session, all bets are off the table, you know, <laughs> everything. Uh, Shane, Jamie? Um, I, I think that like, you know, when I reflect on my, like the things that I do well as a GM and the things I don't do as well as a GM, and I don't mean this in a self-effacing way, but I think I have like a good sense of my strengths and things that aren't so strong. Creating engaging NPCs is way down. Like, I don't think that's something that I do especially well. So I would basically, if I can figure out anything else, I would avoid killing an NPC or running a game where killing NPCs is an expected part of the fiction. Just because if I can make the characters care about an NPC, that is worth so much more to me than the drama I would wring out of their deaths. Uh, so I think that, like, I think a lot of, like, getting GM moves to work well is picking games where the GM moves, like, play to your strengths. And so, yeah, I think a game like Apocalypse World in that sense is probably further from what I'm good at. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good point, right? I also hesitate to kill NPCs because there are things far worse than death that I can inflict on uh, someone. But, but also... I do think, so I did say earlier that I tend to not look at the at the GM moves too closely. I do tend to pick the ones that are unique per PBTA game, right? So, because almost everyone will have um, separate the characters or sometimes the, the claim decision-making, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll keep the ones that are unique to the game just so that, and I'll read it a few times, like with masks. Um, I can run masks like the like on the spot, I have done that before. I would be, have you heard the good news of the TTRPGs and then run masks on the spot for people back when we could still go outside. Um, but I got that way because in between each game, I would reread parts of the book, especially the GM moves over and over and over again until it got to a point where it was really uh, in my subconscious, but but specifically those ones that are unique to, to the game is what I really tend to focus on but I think going back to what Shane said I think it's also like my understanding of PBTA is that all of these GM moves are there as a guideline right and it's still up to you as a GM and as because they're just tools right they're just there to help you so if you don't want to use one of those moves Shane I think you'll still be really great 
at Apocalypse World, right? So uh, you just don't have to use that that move as much as you uh, as you'd like. So, but yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely how I would approach that. Yeah. So question, question from Darren in the chat. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, uh, Darren, this is really good. So I find that making soft and hard moves affects the pacing in my game. A series of hard moves usually means we're zooming in to minutes in a scene. I don't think it's bad, but what are your thoughts on using moves as a pacing mechanic? So actually that's really a, such a good insight, Darren. Um, it's really true. It tends to be that with hard moves, you are like, everything's going into slow motion as something awful is about to happen, right? So, but I do think that like Shane has suggested, it's also okay to use the hard move as an excuse to like cut away, right? Which is still pacing, right? I think. So I do definitely think hard moves and, and soft moves do encourage pacing, which is something I see more in like narrative games versus like what I was used to in trad games, right? Like back in, you know, uh, before, uh, uh, I don't want to say too much because I'm gonna I'm gonna make Lowell feel bad if I bring up a specific old game that isn't old for Lowell. So, so I'll stop talking there. <laughs> but what do you think? What do you think, Shane and Lowell, in response to that question? So I think that's a really good way to put it. Like I hadn't really thought about it like that, but it's really true. And I do like consciously exploit that sometimes in my games. So, like an example would be again the between game that me and Blake and Jamie played in. When we got to the second last session, I had this real sense that I wanted it to be very action packed. I wanted this sense. It's like the second last episode of the season. Everything comes to a head. Uh, and so that meant that I had basically two scenes that were going to play out. There was one that Blake's character and I think uh, Gabe's character were going to have and one that uh, Jamie and one of the other players were going to have. And there was just going to be a lot of hard moves in both those scenes and I was going to go as big and as hard as I could. And that would mean that we spent, you know, essentially the whole session just resolving those two scenes. And I think that worked out really well and was really memorable for, uh, well, for me and I, I hope for the players as well. Yes, yes. I was on the edge of my seat the entire, I lost like two years of my life at that game, which is great, which is great. Absolutely wonderful. Yes. I think another place where pacing is really important, especially as it ties into hard moves that doesn't get enough attention is the death spiral of bad rolls. That there is, there is nothing like, there's no pace killer worse than uh, five, three, two like like when you get in that cycle where where the roller just betrays you and for me there is this this movement with pacing where as i start to see that go down uh, uh i'm dialing the moves up a little bit softer and i'm also trying to do more of the you get what you want but where the hard move is is the the the, the sandwich you know uh, the, the filling in there on that sandwich of that so that we do keep moving we do keep moving forward um, and and I think I said this at the one of the previous seminars the other cheat that I do is the more I see people rolling where we're getting that death spiral of of fails uh, the less rolls I'm calling for I, I want to give them a breather <laughs> I want to try and hand wave if I can a little bit and and space it out, uh, especially if I can use a break to kind of literally break up uh, the, the that cycle, that sequence of things. Uh, so I think Danielle has yeah. a question and mm -hmm. then uh, we have a question from Stephen in the, the chat. Yes, um, great seminar, really, really enjoying it. Um, I guess I had a question kind of like if you dial this way back for somebody who is like super new at a jamming I run I ran one one shot of masks for the gauntlet camp which was really fun um but I noticed that part of what felt different and the only way I could describe it was like it feels kind of not like I'm floating but it feels like all of like the resistance is off like it's totally frictionless and there's nothing to push against and it was really disorienting for a moment because I had players who were coming in and like they weren't 
like walking down a dark museum hallway and I'm rattling things for them to look at and no one is poking no one is looking and I'm just like am I just supposed to jump out of the wall at them am I just supposed to attack them um and I noticed at the end of the session like you know that we kind of figured it out you know I had them but I I had to make a choice to say you have to take a powerful blow now where I was just waiting for them to roll and then depending on the roll giving them a narrative consequence as a result and forgetting that you can just say part of your fail is you have to roll now kind of like the inverse of what you were saying Lowell with the you know kind of if if they're succeeding too much you can just make them roll it again somewhat um or or if they're failing you you can induce more roles, I guess, but I I guess part of my question is just like, how, how do you, how do you know what to push on? Because I, I feel like I didn't give enough hard moves, or I just kind of went all narrative, and that isn't fun either. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can super relate, because Mask was also my first TPTA game, and I had the exact same because I was so used to initiative and AC and <laughs> hit points. Um, so I, I really, I felt weightless, exactly like you said. And it was so hard to, I had to train myself because like, I think the thing with like my experience with more traditional games, it's, it's very reactive over and over again, right? The mechanics are built to like hit each other over and over again versus something like Empowered by the Apocalypse. It's meant to be, a more nebulous open narrative that's more open to everybody's interpretation and what they bring to the table. So I really had to force myself to not wait for a miss or a complication. Like, I think like what was hard for me was if someone succeeded and they rode well, I'd be like, so I can't make anything bad happen now, right? Because they just rode well. So that would, so I would give myself like, I would think I have this like, um, hard move or I have this complication in mind, but they just wrote a success. I go out of my way to make it feel like a really extreme success, a really great success, right? Uh, just so that I feel a little less guilty when I go in for the kill, right? Like right after, so. Um, but that that's one of the ways I think what I had to do early on was just to remind, I would pick like the easier moves. I think like what Shane talked about, like the more mechanical ones, like that's what I would do, like I had to remind myself to inflict conditions and so on more often. And I would literally put it in a post-it. I would give myself only three moves to focus on it first while I got the hang of it and then start adding more later. But yeah, but I'd love to hear what Shane and Lola would have to say about it. Go ahead. Uh, 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 All right, well, I'll say one of the things that I, had to 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 figure out is especially when you get into those moments that are kind of nebulous where people are kind of doing things and there's stuff you know uh, often what i'm looking for is i'm looking for them to do things and at some point i'm saying okay do you think that rises to the level of a move are we are, are we have you have you uh, is this talk kind of pushing towards something are you investigating does it go towards that letting them talk is important uh but also going okay what do you want What's your intent? Uh, I think going to that meta conversation and saying, okay, you've been looking around this room. What is it that you want to get out of this? Like, what are you trying to do? Because they know, like, like they're, they're, they're fishing around, but they kind of want something, but they don't want to say it. Uh, players kind of don't want to, to, to go that level, but, but it's worth stopping them and going, okay, what do you think is going on here? What, what, do, you, what do you want to have? happen where do we where do we think we're going well i think it's i think it's maybe going towards this oh okay that sounds like it's this move then let's shall we move to that or do you want to do a little bit more you know it's a you know i'm guiding them along um and and i will say the other part of that is it did take me a while to realize that oh yeah when 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 the table looks at you you can do those moves then because I was so, okay, you can only act when, when the players make a miss. Once I realized that, oh, you didn't have to do that, you can do those, those cool things that you've got in the back of your head. If they're sitting there and they're like, oh, okay, now I'm going to kick in the door uh, and, and the, the ceiling's going to come down or whatever. Shane? Yeah, so I think like one thing I would say is that I, I find what you're talking about specifically harder in a one shot than in a longer game, just because there's so little time to like let things play out a little more. Um, I really felt that in the Monster Hearts game that I ran today, 
one of the players just had like a, a quite laid back play style you know I was trying to to thrust them into some conflict and they were really like oh no I think I just let it go you know which is is fine and if we had a longer game it would really be okay because I could spend some time like figuring out what that player and that character want and you know allow it to play out but in the one shot it, it you know it just has to happen now like if it doesn't happen in the next hour we're not we're not getting that action so I think it is harder. Um, I think like the point that when the table looks to you is the time to make a move is a really good one. Um, I have sometimes for one shots made lists of specific moves that I want to make. Well, this is not even for one shots for games. So for example, when I ran my uh, cheerleading themed Thirsty Sword Lesbians game, I watched a lot of cheerleading movies, documentaries, all kinds of things. And I made a list of like bad things that happened to cheerleaders that I wanted to like hit. And so, you know, someone falls down and hurts their ankle. I had that, I was ready to cross it off. Um, the other team knows your routine already, had that, like cross it off. Like all the beats that you would want to hit in a cheerleading movie, I had them ready to go. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd say, like both because, you know, in the gauntlet style of play, we generally take a break on the hour, or even if you're not doing that, you can always call for a break. If I'm not sure how to make the action move, I will call for like a five minute break and just tell the players, I just need to think about what's going to happen. Can we take five? And players are very good about that in my experience. Yeah, yeah. I think those are, those are really good points that Shane brought up. Like when I was first running masks, I would, I would have the short list of like, things to do when I don't know what to do, right? And then I'd be like, Aegis comes in and reveals a double agent or something like, and, and you could technically map it to one of the GM moves afterwards, but it really helped for me to be very specific. Like, what does that move actually translate into? And then so later it became more natural. Yeah, I think that's a really good, good point that Shane brought up. Uh, uh, a, an easy way sometimes I'll do a, an echo of that is I'll write down the name of the PC and I'll write down, here are three things that could happen to them to complicate their lives. Oh, so and, that's and, how you know how to hurt me. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, we have three more questions in the chat. So we're going to get through those uh, from Stephen, Bill, and uh, Mike. Uh, so uh, let's start with this one. Uh, question in Forge games, generally downtime actions are not actions that have risk. But how have you approached introducing consequences during downtime actions, particularly if a PC fictionally describes doing something really risky? Uh, Jamie, let's start with you. And then I have some thoughts on this too. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I also got tricked into thinking bad things can't happen during downtime actions, which really hampered me as a GM. But uh, once again, playing with Sean has really helped me break out of that. I think what's important is that Risky things can still happen, but it's never going to feel as bad or as intense or uh, players will still have a way to get around things. But uh, definitely I've, I've tried to remove that idea that bad things can't happen to a player during a downtime action. Like if it really calls for it, if they really did do something really risky and the role was bad, I will still make them mark harm, right? If it makes sense for what was going on in the fiction. And because once again, um, if it's not a fortune role, they can still choose to resist it if they want to, right? So, um, but yeah, I think I think that's definitely something that, that tripped me up a lot. And it was only like recently that I started to feel more comfortable being able to like let them still have consequences just once again like I guess like the idea is like they're softer moves maybe or they're not as hard as I would normally go so during a score but yeah how about you Lil? well and I think downtime especially if you're doing like risky stuff in downtime it's it's working on a different layer of play so what what's at risk is are they annoying their friends are they stacking out obligations are they you know, uh, uh, like giving out favors to people, are, are people starting to threaten them? Are, are shadowy figures coming? Like those are all, uh, a lot of it is, is suggest future problems, uh, start building up uh, the weight of the, the world on them for that. That's, that's a little more, more meta. That's, that's been my approach there. Oh, and I also want to say like the last score we went on to in Blades in the Dark, 
was really interesting. What because what we're doing is we play in stream, but then we do a lot of the um, we do the downtime actions on stream as well. But the gather info preparing for a score, we do it on our Discord server, mm. uh, just for the three of us. And what's interesting is they wrote three gather information roles and they failed each one. And each time they tried to make things better to do a fortune roll, they failed all of them. And so it got to the point where one of the once again, Sean, who likes to hurt himself, was like, you know, Jamie, if you want to say we end up in jail and it's been four years later, you could do that. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> so what we ended up doing, though, was uh, they were trying to gather information from the red sashes. And instead, it turned out there was a trap laid for them the whole time. The red sashes had already made uh, a bargain with the arc vendors, which is a, a made up faction for our game. And so instead of them preparing for a score and planning for a score, the score started with them in in the spirit warden prison, right? And so normally I wouldn't have thought of doing that because to me, the structure of Blades feels so sacred, right? But the fact that um, Sean himself was like saying, no, I mean, if we, we, we kept rolling really badly and things are like uh, really, really, really terrible. I think it makes sense that we go into a score and we don't, we have no way of preparing for it. We started a desperate position. There is no engagement role. So I think one of the things to remember is like, these the structure in blades is really a guideline and it's up to you how you want to interpret any of those rules at any point right so that was the first time i did something like that it felt really really daring so yeah yeah that was really interesting <laughs> uh I, so so shane will skip over you for this forged question so we'll go on to the next one but i'm going to throw this one to you uh first then uh this is from bill uh, Bill says, uh, people sometimes say it's easier to feel comfortable making harder GM moves in Forge in the Dark because players can resist. But have you seen or designed mechanics in other styles of games that allow the GMs that same sense of freedom to be harsh without worrying they go too far, essentially some kind of resist, some kind of change around? How much do safety tools like Lines and Veils or the X card fill that role? So what, what are your thoughts on that, Shane? Um, well, I'm sure lots of people here are familiar with the Between and Brindlewood Bay, which do have a mechanic. I don't know exactly what we're talking about when we say resist stress, but I think it's somewhat similar. Like the character has an option they can take that lets them, you know, essentially negate a bad role, um, get a better outcome uh, by by taking on some other sorts of fictional consequences. The um, So that, that definitely seems to me to work in the same way. Um, I mean, I, I think... Like often if I'm making a harsher move, I will think about explicitly checking in with the player. So that's not quite a safety tool um, or sometimes offering them two different moves. So this wasn't exactly harshness, but Jamie, I remember in the between, um, there was a point where I wanted to off, I wanted to hit you with the consequence that you would gain the condition drawn to the man in the golden mask, but I didn't want to just like put that on a player because it like without getting some consent. So I don't remember what it is, but I offered you two conditions. I was like, look, Jamie, you can have either of these two conditions. You can have like stabbed in the in the thigh. I don't know what it was, something like that, or you can have drawn to the man in the golden mask. I 100% knew which one of those you were going to take. Like it was no doubt for one second. Um, but it, it allowed you to, to like actively consent and affirm. And I think you can do the same thing with like harsher consequences um, at the table. Jamie? Yeah, I just want to say, Shane, that's like such a great example. I was definitely thinking of the between and Brindlewood Bay, like the, it's very powerful in the between because you mark um, what is essentially like the character's HP in the long run, right? Because they can only mark it so often before they succumb to, you know, their dark future. But basically what happens is if you roll a miss, you just have to use up the specific resource and you shift the result by one step, right? Which is really powerful. I've seen players in the between and Brenda would be who did it like twice, right? Like they, they asked me like, am I allowed to do that? And I'd be like, yes, please burn through your resources as much as you like, my dear, no problem. Um, but I think like technically you're only supposed to be able to use it once, but I, I, I will let people uh, do that if they like. Yeah, and I think like personally as a, as a game designer, that's also something I, I think of myself as well because I've gotten, I really just enjoy how Forge in the Dark lets you do that. It feels like, 
some people have called it like an interesting safety tool, the resistance. And I think I do agree because you can say like, no, that doesn't happen. I don't want that to happen, right? And if you said that in any other game, right, this has this has incited numerous Twitter wars is to say like, oh, at my D&D table, I just saw the jam, that doesn't happen. And people like um, lose it. But, but I do think like more games that, that allow players the option to do something like that is very cool. And it's something I've been experimenting with in my games. I think Hearts of Wulin has that, right? Uh, designed bonds. by someone amazing yeah. here. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so bonds give you a plus one or a negative, uh, I'm sorry, plus one to a roll after you rolled it, right? So you can burn through your bonds and, and change the effect of your roll. So yeah, I definitely think it's something we're seeing in games uh, moving forward. And in terms of how, I feel like I don't, personally, I don't see the strict connection between safety tools and hard moves and soft moves. Um, I do think safety tools are more about what to not bring into the game from the start, but but I do think it's something that can come up in the moment, right? Like this happened to me personally, I was in a game and I get very attached to my NPCs. I was a player and another player just killed an NPC I was really trying to create a genuine connection with, like just, you know, uh, and, and I it was, it was still very early on I, I still, because of, uh, uh, of my past with the trauma and certain things, I have a hard time in the moment saying something bad is happening. I usually need time to process it before I, before I can say anything, but, um, but the players checked in afterwards and they offered the moment to rewind that. So I think that's how safety tools can, can come in if a move is too harsh, right? If a move is too hard, so. But what do you think, Lil? I think the most powerful phrase that you have as a GM is does that sound okay it, it, that that what shane suggested about check-ins what what jamie's saying about follow-ups is when i throw something that might be hard or harsh or we're going to go on is you know does that sound okay and if the player goes mm, that's kind of not what i was looking for it's kind of what i wanted maybe they haven't communicated their intent or maybe i've st stepped on something that 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 they're not feeling it. and if and we can negotiate and I make that a habit. I almost always say that, you know, and, and most people say, yeah, cool. And then we move on. So we, we've done a check-in. I think regular check-ins, because if you get in the habit of that, it doesn't break the flow. It's not changing anything. And then somebody will say, hey, no, that isn't what I want to have happen. We, we fix it and we move on. Uh, but it allows you to go hard if you need to, knowing that you're also going to give the player the space to to put their hands up uh, to say, that's that's not what I wanted. Um, I think that's that's really important. Let's take the last question that we have, uh, which was from, uh, let's see, where is this from, uh, Mike? Uh, in general, how do you use hard and soft GM moves in a way that the players still feel like their characters are badass or at least competent when the dice are betraying them? Jamie, you wanna wanna answer that? Yeah, my favorite thing is when the players roll a miss. And this is kind of why I don't like it when people write into a game or think that a miss means a fail. I think that is um, that does not have to happen. One of my favorite things to do is, yeah, you're badass in the moment. Yeah, things, you know, you did exactly what you wanted to do. Yeah, you're super awesome. This is the unintended consequence, right? And so they still have that moment of, of badassery. I think one of the times I did that, it was in a D&D &D game because I had been running a lot of PVTF to that point. And then my friends were like watching Stranger Things. And so they wanted to. So I was like, okay, I will go ahead and take out my dusty D&D &D books and we will play fourth edition. Wahaha. But anyway, so uh, so we played D&D &D, and they were fighting against like these huge spiders, uh, dire spiders. Um, you know, I will get into more detail in case someone has a, has a thing about that. But basically when they... So the, the the creatures that we're up against, uh, they just assumed we're like monsters, right? And so they they did this badass thing, and you know, um, but then they they rolled a miss, and so I was still in PBTA mode, where like that doesn't necessarily mean a failure, right? Because I was so it was so in line. So they rolled a miss, and uh, and I said, no, you like you you killed the spider. They're like, oh, amazing, right? And they're like, yeah, describe to me what happens. Like, what does it look like? Oh yeah, I tear it apart, and blah blah blah, da, 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 go into it. And then I said. Okay, when it's over, the, the other spider that survived looks and says, my love, I'm so sorry, I'll avenge you. And they're like, oh, the spiders are talking, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> they actually like it completely changed um uh <laughs> the players felt really uh they, they decided to make amends and reparations to the spiders after that but uh but anyway so so that's something that i like to do is they still get that moment of badassery but uh maybe things didn't work out like they like they thought it would what do you think Lowell? Uh, I think it's always, always good to, uh, you're a badass, but maybe you went too far. Maybe, maybe, you, you know, that, that, and when you did this, the, the, you, you caused extra damage, or maybe when you did it, you look so, so brutal in doing this, that somebody gasps and, and looks at you differently. Uh, uh, or you, you alienate someone, or maybe now someone perceives you as a rival. They see you do this, like like you can always always give them what they want, and then throw in a few emotional tweaks on top of that. That doesn't destroy, doesn't undercut, doesn't uh, denigrate what they've done, but but adds adds a nice twist. They knew they missed. They kind of got what they wanted. We're kind of moving the story forward, but oof, that's something you're gonna have to deal with later. Shane, yeah, I mean, I think quite similarly, and Mike, like going back to something you said in the chat earlier, I think giving them what they want is probably my favorite GM move, like hard GM move to make. Um, I have many variations on give them what they want as a hard move that I like to play. One of them is just inexplicably give them what they want and they'll all freak out trying to work out how that happened and I can, you know, figure out later what it's going to be. Um, the villain can offer them exactly what they want. Then they're going to have this whole moral dilemma and complication to deal with. Um, I run a lot of sort of weird horror games. So one is just they're getting what they want and it doesn't make sense. Um, to, to give an example, in the Yellow King game I ran recently, uh, so not exactly a GM move, but kind of similar, one of the characters was an author who had tried to get this publisher to publish some of his work. And the, the move was that the publisher arrived at his door being like, I'm obsessed. I've read your work now. I'm obsessed. I must have it. You must sign this contract. And then moments later, uh, another publisher arrived at the door saying, don't go with him. His, his press is garbage. Come sign with my much more prestigious press. And before long, there was a half dozen publishers just had brawling in the stairwell outside while the players like desperately tried to work out what to do about them. So I think all kinds of variations on giving them something that they really want uh, in a terrible way are really great ways to, to make them feel good uh, while also making it just awful for them. Yeah, actually, one of my favorite tricks is um, I'll say something like, yeah, you, 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 like, for example, this really happened in a game, uh, you swing your sword and blah, 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 but um, content warning, some body horror because uh, tends to come up in my games, uh, is as you were swinging, what other people see, like, I turn to the other players and I go, as they do that, you can see like these eyes growing along their flesh and looking around at the sword and the sword grows with these unholy ruins, blah, 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 and everybody's like, oh. <gasps> And then so the player who's holding the sword looks at me and is like, how do I, what's going on? Am I, am I, am I okay? I go, oh yeah, you feel fine. You feel great even. You've never felt better before this moment. <laughs> I just leave it at that. <laughs> That's one of my favorite <laughs> ways of dealing with that. When, when Sherry has described Shane running, she's described Shane as going, oh, interesting. Sort of a thoughtful pause that Sherry yeah, knows, scary, Sherry knows it's about to get really bad true, true, true. Uh, <laughs> after that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Shane, for uh, uh, giving us uh, your insight and being willing to, to come and do this. What is midday for you? What is late night for me? Uh, talk on this. And, and thanks, everyone uh, who came and participated uh, in this, asking questions or listening. Uh, it, it's nice to have a bunch of people here doing that. Uh, this was this was super fun. Hopefully, we'll do some some more of these things in the future. Uh, we will uh, be posting the video up on on YouTube, uh, and then my hope is that we'll also uh, take the audio out and have this up uh, as uh, I might have Rich clean it up the uh, a little bit, but we'll we'll put it up in the uh, uh, Gauntlet podcast feed at some point in the future so that everybody can listen to it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a, a lovely night. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your GCOG weekend. Bye. Have a great time, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs>